From CPRI and the CPRI Knowledge Hub, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today, we look at social-emotional learning and early results from one of the most comprehensive SEL implementation studies ever performed. So there's really two main questions. The first one is, do students benefit if schools and after-school programs partner together to work on and foster kids' social and emotional learning? And then the second is simply, what does it take to do that work? We welcome the RAND Corporation's Heather Schwartz, lead author of a new report offering some early lessons from the study and some key recommendations for districts and out-of-school time providers across the country. My sense is that communities who are wishing to do SEL work and roll it out, whether it's across their schools or their OST programs or both, should really be thinking in terms of several years. We discuss those recommendations and more right now on Research Minutes. Hello and welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith E. Miller, Managing Editor of the CPRI Knowledge Hub. Today, we're happy to welcome Heather Schwartz, Director of the Pre-K to 12 Educational Systems Program and a Senior Policy Researcher with the RAND Corporation. Thanks so much for joining us, Heather. Thanks for having me. So today we're discussing a new report, which was co-authored by nearly a dozen RAND Corporation researchers titled Early Lessons from Schools and Out-of-School Time Programs Implementing Social and Emotional Learning. Uh, It's now available at RAND.org, and it offers findings from one of the most comprehensive implementation studies of social emotional learning, or SEL, to date and some valuable lessons for school districts and out-of-school time providers across the country. To start, could you just give us a little bit of background? How did this study originate, and what was your team hoping to learn? Sure. So just to give you a little bit of background, first, I'll just talk to you about the motivation for the study. As you may know, there's a growing amount of research out there about how people learn that's showing that schools need not only to teach academics, but they also need to teach social and emotional learning. And when I say social and emotional learning, I'm because there's no one consensus definition for the term, but a very common one is comes from CASEL, the so-called CASEL 5. And I'm referring to skills like self-awareness, self-management, good relationship skills, being socially aware, and making responsible decision-making. And so the Wallace Foundation was responding to this growing amount of research about the importance of schools um, working on social and emotional learning. And they also were really compelled by some research coming out of Chicago about the potential for schools and out-of-school time programs to partner. So when you think of -of out-of-school time programs, in this case, we're really mostly talking about after-school programs. So like YMCA or Boys and Girls Clubs or local park and recreation type programming. Um, And so the Wallace Foundation started what they call PASELI, Partnerships for Social and Emotional Learning Initiative, in 2016. And they entered into a grant with us for RAND to be the independent third-party evaluator of this six-year initiative. So there's really two main questions that are driving the PASELI research. The first one is, do students benefit if schools and after-school programs partner together to work on and foster kids' social and emotional learning. And then the second is simply, what does it take to do that work? So the second question is obviously about implementation, and it really, the implementation questions are just as important as these effects questions of SEL in schools and after-schools. Paselli has six total communities. There's Boston, Dallas, Denver, Palm Beach County, Tacoma, and Tulsa. And in those communities, there's anywhere from um, five to seven sites working on SEL right now. So when I say a site, I'm referring to an elementary school and one or more after-school program partner. So at a campus, at an elementary school campus, there might be just one OST program partner, or there might be as many as four or five at that campus. And these sites, of which there's 38 total across the six communities, these 38 sites are working over a period of four years 
and they're taking a four-pronged approach to SEL. The first is that they're just trying to partner with each other. So the school and the OST programs are taking a coordinated approach to SEL. The second is to try to create a positive climate for both students and staff. The third is to offer explicit SEL instruction. So when you think of explicit SEL instruction, these could be brief or even 30-minute lessons that are about SEL skills. They could be offered in, say, a morning meeting or an afternoon meeting. They're often standalone lessons from a curricula, like Second Step is a very um, popular SEL curricula. And it would be an instructor teaching students an SEL skill, like how to identify others and their own emotions. And then the fourth approach that they're taking in these 38 campuses is to integrate SEL. So what I mean by that is you could think of um, teaching students not just to work together, like turn to your partner and work on Project X, but explicitly teaching students how to productively work together and give offering that kind of teaching in regular activities, whether it's a math class or a science class or an arts class after school program or a sports activity. So that I would say that is really in a nutshell how Pacelli works. Your your team took an interesting approach to sort of analyzing, like you said, not only sort of the impacts but the implementation. Could you just give us a little bit of insight into how you approach this work and how you actually analyze both of those areas? Sure. So we've been collecting what we think is the largest amount of SEL implementation data to date in any one research study on this subject. And what we're doing specifically is each year we're surveying staff, so both school staff and after-school program staff who work in each of those 38 sites. We're also, I should have mentioned earlier, we're also surveying staff in a set of comparison sites. So there's 38 sites that are working on SEL now, there's another 38 sites who are demographically similar from the same six communities, but in essence, they're waiting in the wings. They're on a staggered schedule, so they're going to start, and actually they started their SEL this year, and the reason for that is because of COVID, that was moved up a year. They were normally supposed to start SEL this next school year. So we're surveying staff to in both the the sites that started SEL a couple of years ago, and we survey staff who are in these comparison sites. We're also conducting interviews at each of those campuses, and we're doing in-person observations. We've been doing that annually. And in the first two years of the study, we collected more than 5,000 survey responses. We did about 800 interviews, and we observed somewhere around 3,000, a little bit more instructional activities, like a math class or an arts class and non-instructional activities like snack, recess, lunch. The point of all this is to get a really comprehensive picture of climate, of explicit SEL instruction, integration of SEL, and of adults' attitudes and beliefs about SEL. So we've been doing that annually, and we're going up through this last year. This is the fourth year in which the 38 campuses have been implementing explicit SEL in the first phase of schools. So that's how we're measuring implementation. Separately, we're going to be measuring students' outcomes, by, and we have been collecting each year student attendance, um, students' test scores on academic standardized tests, and then also students have been taking a direct measure of their SEL skills on an online assessment called CellWeb. So let's jump right into your findings. Um, I understand they include some approaches and decisions that worked, uh, as well as some that maybe didn't work so well. Uh, Could you walk us through what you learned about SEL program implementation in these communities? Sure. Um, It has probably been evident from my answer. This has been a pretty complex project for communities to implement. And really, we learned that it took longer than they expected to get it off the ground in each community, partly due to that complexity. Um, Looking at the central district office and the out-of-school time intermediaries, so these are OSTIs, they're organizations that connect the and, and sort of coordinate the work of OST programs in a region. 
so they the school district and the OSTIs are the ones who are really coordinating the SEL work in their community. It took them longer to get their initiatives off the ground than they were uh, intending. But once they had hired a manager, an SEL manager, that proved to be very important to getting the work really going. So the hire of an SEL manager, and then once they start to simplify and to distill the essentials of what the schools and the OST programs were expected to do, that helped move the work along. There's really been a lot of flux in the six communities. There's been high staff turnover, budget cuts, superintendent turnover, teacher walkouts, of course now COVID, that have slowed down the work. And so the general message that we gleaned was that it's important not to bite off more than you can chew. Hire an SEL manager to help lead that work and keep it simple for the sites so that they know what to do. So that was a core message. Once those schools and OST programs got started with the work, we saw that that many of them, not all of them, followed sort of a loose sequence of progressively deeper adoption of SEL. So as a first step, they told us in interviews that it was really important, if not critical, to start with the adults' SEL skills. So one of their earliest activities was professional development and use of SEL in staff meetings to help model the kind of SEL that they wanted instructors to then go and use with students. So that often came first. Second, the, the place where we saw a fair amount of uptake was the use of small, short, relatively easy practices of SEL rituals. So here I'm talking about things like instructors using personalized warm welcome to greet each student as they come in the classroom door, or using a really short calming transition, like a belly breathing, to help kids transition when they come back from recess to transition in, back into, say, an academic class. Those kinds of SEL rituals were the activities that we, we saw that staff tended to take up first. And following that was the, we saw more and more delivery of explicit written SEL lessons. So again, referring to things like second step or mind up or getting along together, those kinds of SEL curricula that offer lessons for instructors to use. And here we saw them starting to, to be used, but we would also see how they could easily get crowded out by other pressures in the school days. They tended to get shortened, sometimes skipped. Um, and so it was proving a challenge to try to make sure to protect time for explicit SEL in the school day, especially. And then the final stage in the sequence that we've seen campuses um, as they progress in their, in their implementation of SEL was the integration of SEL into academics and regular activities. And that's really what sort of trailed and come last. The communities have struggled to create concrete guidance for instructors to use about how to integrate SEL. Um, but ironically, uh, there's high degree of support for integration of SEL among instructors, and often the kinds of things that they describe as simply good teaching are, in fact, examples of integrating SEL into classes. So we think that there's really ripe opportunity for the integration of SEL, but it's also proved to be one of the most challenging aspects to get off the ground. And that brings us to the next section of this report that we're discussing today. It actually includes a number of recommendations for school districts and out-of-school time providers hoping to implement or improve their own SEL programs. Um, could you share some of them with us? Sure. Well, I just want to make sure that as a caveat here to keep in mind that this report that we've just published was looking at just the first two out of four years of this first phase of the SEL initiative. So we expect that our recommendations are going to evolve over that four-year time horizon in line with the community's own work evolving. But nevertheless, we thought it was really important to offer at least early lessons that the districts and these out-of-school time intermediaries and schools and OST programs experience so that others could go ahead and use that if they were wanting to launch their own SEL work. And so just to give you a few, few examples, one of the early lessons uh, that we, like I've mentioned earlier, is pretty common across the six communities. 
relatively high degree of staff turnover, especially in OSC programs. So if, if launching SEL work, expect staff turnover and to help sustain your SEL work, even as staff leave, very important to document in, in writing through some onboarding documents, what kind of work staff should do when for the SEL initiative to continue, even as staff turnover. A second lesson as an example, and there's, gosh, I would say probably 40 or more lessons in this report, but I'm just going to give you a few as a flavor, was that those short SEL rituals that I mentioned, like the warm welcome or calming transitions or optimistic closures, those were pretty good starting points for both school staff and out-of-school staff to use. It's kind of like a good way to get the foot in the door in building the use of SEL. It's fairly easy to train, they can be relatively quick, and they can adapt and be used in a wide variety of classes. Um, as an example of another lesson, if schools and OST programs are going to partner on SEL work, we found that it was important to acknowledge that there is a power differential that does favor schools. This was a common theme that arose across the six communities. And for that, for that partnership to be healthy, robust, strong, and to have trust, it's important to be explicit about that power differential, but also to acknowledge the strengths that the OST programs contribute to the SEL work, just as the strengths the schools contribute to the SEL work. There are some unique and disparate strengths that those two organizations bring to SEL, so they can be a nice complement to one another as they work to build a sort of continuous experience for students who are spending their for, you know, first half of their day in the school as they continue there and, and move into the OST programming side. So there's a lot of potential for the partnerships, but it does need a fair amount of work to build the partnership and to just acknowledge some of the structural barriers that exist. And then a final example is really helps to build concrete strategies into professional development to help staff differentiate SEL instruction. This was a very common request among staff on the surveys that we've been administering annually is they're saying, yes, I want to see more modeling and more practicing of how I should give SEL lessons, but t teach me also how I can differentiate these SEL lessons for different students and different needs and for students from different cultural backgrounds. That is a really strong demand from staff. And so therefore we put in a, a recommendation relating to professional development to help supply those teachers and, and instructors with concrete activities that they can use in the classroom themselves for that kind of differentiation. As you mentioned at the top, um, SEL has received a lot of attention in recent years, not only from researchers, but increasingly from educators and policymakers as well. Uh, have your thoughts about SEL or SEL implementation changed at all following this work? Actually, it has. And coming out of this report that we just published, covering the first two out of four years of the Pacelli project, my sense is that communities who are wishing to do SEL work and roll it out, whether it's across their schools or their OST programs or both, should really be thinking in terms of several years, not just one year, to ramp up to full adoption of SEL. If they think in that, with that mindset of several year time horizon, then they can layer on one to two discrete new instructional activities for students per year because trying to introduce too much at once can leave unfinished, confused work. Especially for schools, they already have a tremendous amount of instruction and services to provide within their time. Time is always um, scarce, and it's better to be realistic about how much bandwidth both school and out-of-school time staff have to adopt new practices. So that's, I would say, probably the first, or one of the first things that, that comes to mind when I think about what we've learned from this report. And another lesson that's emerged is that districts and um, out-of-school time intermediaries should be as concrete as possible about the SEL work that they're trying to launch. And they can do this by envisioning the end goal, meaning like what actual observable behaviors and activities 
should a visitor see if he or she were to spend a whole day in a school or an after school? What is it that, what SEO activities, what kind of climate, what kind of behaviors, what would staff be doing, what would students be doing? And thinking through that angle and then working backwards from there to sequence out what specific supports that district or OSTI should provide and what kind of communication they need to give about expectations to schools and after-school programs. I say all this sort of backward mapping because communities in Pacelli had struggled to define SEL at the outset and to develop a shared terminology that took a fair amount of time. So it would help to get people on the same page if they're thinking through what they're trying to see on the ground. What are the look for us? What are the do nows? And that would help sort of make the SEL a little bit less abstract and easier and and prevent some of the kind of talking past one another uh, that can easily happen. And finally, as this work is part of a, a larger six-year initiative by the Wallace Foundation, I, I have to ask if we should expect more of this kind of research going forward, um, either from your team or others who are working in the SEL field. Yes, this report that we just put out is in fact the first of five. And we are going to be publishing a series of six case studies. We're going to publish a final implementation and outcomes analysis. And we're also going to publish a how-to guide. We're going to revisit the early lessons that we published uh, just this couple of weeks ago and see how they have evolved, probably add to them and refine them, including them in a final how-to guide. And then there's going to, as the fifth report, it's a to-be-determined topic. We're going to see which one topic crops up as the most urgent or useful for the field and issue a report on that as well. So there's still lots to come. This is incredibly valuable work, Heather, um, and we're certainly all going to keep an eye on it as your team moves forward. And we want to encourage our listeners to go and read the full report that we discussed today. Again, it's titled Early Lessons from Schools and Out-of-School Time Programs Implementing Social and Emotional Learning. It's now available at RAND.org. Uh, Heather Schwartz, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes or to subscribe to the series, you can find us at researchminutes.org. To share thoughts on today's episode or to suggest a future topic, you can follow us on Twitter at CPRI Hub. That's C-P-R-E Hub.